Okay, well, we'll um, make a start. And thank you very much for everyone uh, coming along uh, today. I'm Nick Singer. I'm uh, an employment practitioner here at 42 Bedford Row. Um, I've been practicing now for about 16 years. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the life uh, of an employment tribunal claim from start to finish. Uh, and at each stage, um, I'm going to give you some um, some tips about each stage. And the idea is hopefully by the end, you'll have some tips for each stage to make it as easy as possible um, and as clear as possible to present a claim at tribunal. As I say, it's about helping, helping me and other barristers to present the claim as easily as possible. Um, the, I'm aiming to spend about 30 or so minutes talking and then I'll take some questions. Uh, of course, we all know there's nothing less reliable than a barrister's estimate. Um, so hopefully I won't run over, but there's there's the first tip. If you're ever in tribunal and the judge asks you how long the trial's going to be, so it's, well, I think it'll be uh, three days, uh, madam, but of course uh, I'd be very much uh, appreciative if I could uh, have some input from you. So I'll read this out. Um, a claim form sets out a legal claim. This is a quote from, from the case, as you can see, CVD. Um, it's not a witness statement, although in this case, both the claim form and response in this case bear many similarities to a witness statement. Ideally, in a claim form, the author should seek to set out a brief statement of relevant facts and the cause of action relied upon by the claimant. The purpose of doing so is to allow the other side uh, to understand what it is they have done or not done, which is said to be unlawful. It should be clear from the document claim form itself within the brief summary of the relevant factual events which facts are relevant to which claim, if more than one is advanced. The respondent can then properly respond to the claim or claims. The respondent can admit, not admit, or deny the facts and claims asserted by the claimant, and where appropriate, set out a brief summary of the relevant facts the respondent asserts occurred. Lawyers will or should understand that each of the phrases admit, not admit, or deny have a particular meaning in this context. The task in hand when setting out a claim or response certainly for an instructed lawyer, is to distill the relevant factual matters to their essential or key component parts. During that, uh, effectively, will often be more, doing that will effectively uh, often be more difficult and take more time than simply reciting lengthy facts and then listing a series of claims. It is often, however, time well spent. Different considerations obviously apply where parties represent themselves and the documents are prepared by people who are not lawyers. However, the basic principles remain good. The claim form should set out what the claim is in, and a brief summary of the facts relevant to each particular claim. Uh, this case, in my judgment, is a paradigm example of that which can occur when a claim is not set out with sufficiently precision. Valuable time can be lost, costs can increase. There may be a delay in the case being heard because the parties are not clear precisely what issues are in dispute or consider that they have inadequate time to meet inadequate time to meet the case that is advanced against them once they've understood it. Regrettably, I consider that some criticism must be leveled in this case at the manner in which the claim and response were set out. Um, so that that I understand the anxiety uh, when pleading a claim that you just absolutely want to get absolutely everything in there. There's that anxiety. Well, in cross-examination, why is not in the claim form? There's a uh, dis distinction between that and the witness statement. Uh, so definitely understand it. But the, the, the case law is clear and the, the way the wind is blowing is clear um, that really it has to be concise, hit the key points. And of course, this authority can be cited if uh, there's any um, suggestion that there's a pleading point taken when, when it comes to submissions and there's any uh, uh, problems in terms of the difference between the claim form and the witness statements and things said in cross-examination. So uh, some general points when you are looking to uh, plead the claim, speak directly to the relevant parties, see original documents, Keep on the lookout for clues for what uh, you have not been shown. Don't be afraid to challenge your clients. Um, include the relevant narrative. Always ask what part does the fact play in proving the claim? Uh, and as I say, they're a good narrative, clear, coherent, ordered pathway to victory. So speaking to the relevant parties, um, 
getting too much information from sort of a third party can be a bit dangerous at times. Make sure that you understand what the chain is. So, for example, if you're speaking to someone in HR, so you're getting someone from HR, who are they getting instructions from? Is it is it someone further down the line? It's very, very important that you understand when pleading it for accuracy. You know, is this something which has been assumed rather than something which has actually happened? So it's very, very important that the person who you are speaking to uh, understands that. And we all, all see it in conferences where witnesses say, yes, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that's true, or it's, it's probably true, or, or sh surely true, or all sorts of variations that witnesses come up with where the <laughs> judge will say, you know, it, it's yes or no, there, there's no caveats. And that, that can be very important to clarify. Well, I think that's probably true. And what, what are we actually finding out um, and, and from who? Um, looking at original documents, what hasn't been shown, of course, you may get documents, but sometimes there are documents referred to within the other documents. So make sure you've got absolutely everything you need in front of you. And narrative is so important. I mean, it really, really is important. I can understand when you're starting a claim um, or you're even responding to a claim, you know, the time pressures and you just want to get out of fact. But it's just worth taking a little step back and thinking to yourself, what's the story? we're trying to tell here. Um, you know, what, what, what's, what's the headline? Are you trying to show, you know, this was a sad situation for everyone, but we had no choice. Is the claim, if a respondent, a nightmare person to deal with, is it some kind of um, combination? But as I say, when you're presenting the case, that's the headline, when you take a step back, what's the story I'm trying to tell? So ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Tribunal is gonna start off in every case, by listing facts and you just want to basically see your story coming back at you that that's the ideal and at, at this stage it's a really good idea to try and um, hammer that down think carefully about what species of claims to in, uh, to include uh, analysis of the facts of this case in terms of indirect discrimination has an air of unre uh, unreality the temptation to place a single series of events simultaneously in various different legal categories is for lawyers at least ever present claims will not necessarily be improved by the number of different ways they are pleaded matters to consider does the type of claim comfortably fit the facts, weak claims take up the most effort. Of course, there are always things that you have to weigh, statutory caps, um, the burden on, on your client in terms of work, limitations, you can always plead in the alternative. Um, but as you can see in the clip art, uh, this is a very, uh, very stressful thing uh, to do. Uh, there is an obvious temptation in directing the complainant to select her best 10 points. In many discrimination cases, however, this will not be consistent with the just determination of the claims made. The ET will have to consider the complete picture of evidence to fairly answer the question whether there has or has not been unlawful discrimination on the relative protected grounds. So as lawyers, we're always looking at this, uh, the, you know, tribunal in one case says, well, there's, there's too many, and then a tribunal in the other case saying, well, there's not enough. It's a very, very difficult balancing act, and I, I do understand how difficult it is. Um, but it really is worth um, thinking about it. So, so, for example, in a direct disability claim, the comparator has the same abilities as the claimant. So you're looking at a disabled claimant, comparator may have no disability with the same abilities or a different disability with the same uh, abilities. It's very hard to win a claim like that. You might win it, but really think, are you going to add anything with a, a direct disability discrimination claim? You've probably got a Section 15 claim. You've probably got a reasonable adjustments claim. Is it really adding anything? Another good example, again, for disability, an indirect disability discrimination claim, much harder to succeed on and much more complicated than a reasonable adjustments claim. I get it. There, there may be tactical reasons and there may be good reasons to include it, but often it really, really um, doesn't help. And I understand sometimes, you know, you want to throw the kitchen sink as a claimant, when you're settling, throw the kitchen sink at a certain responder, and 50 courses of action, maybe you'll get a settlement. Um, but it is very difficult to win as a claim, especially in discrimination claim. Um, you've often, you know, you're, you're usually gonna have a, a represented respondent, solicitors, counsel, respondent, usually gonna just try and package a claim nice and neatly. And if you've got a tribunal, it's very little time 
and maybe doesn't have as much time. And if they've got to deal with 15 causes of action, they've got to think about an indirect disability discrimination claim, which takes about three or four hours to analyze legally. Um, it's not going to help your, your client. Um, now, I know as lawyers, we are always worried uh, and we're always thinking about risk. We don't want to risk it. We don't want to risk missing something. But equally, pleading too much, I think, is, is risky for your clients as well. So I, I do think it's worth um, spending a bit of time on, on, on that and making sure you don't throw the kitchen sink at this. So onto the grounds of resistance, uh, reflect on all aspects of the legal test. Don't deny every constituent part of the legal test for the sake of it. Think carefully about pleading to cases that might be there, meaning um, if, 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 if it's a badly pleaded claim form, um, and you plead, well, respond to this, respond to this, respond to this. Judge might have said, well, that claim's not in there. But if you pleaded to something, well, then just when you pleaded to it, it is obviously in there, which might make it more difficult when you're uh, looking at amendments, potentially. Um, you have your backup case. Um, think how to frame it. Uh, Polky, Chaggett and contributory conduct of your friends rather than a one sentence of the thought. Um, what's very useful, I say, in the in the grounds of resistance, I know it can be quite tempting to, um, or you don't have instructions, or it could be tempting to be more generic, but it can be really, really useful if in the grounds of resistance, or at the very least, when you go to the first PH, um, you've, you've conceded things or clarified things very clearly. So being able to go, for example, when something is obviously a protected act in the victimization claim, if you can go to the tribunal, it's conceded. Yeah, that is, that's not an issue. We've conceded the protected act. Um, if there's a, a PCP and a reasonable adjustments claim, and if the claim form is, you know, it, it, you can always take technical points, I know, but if it's pretty clear from the claim form as a whole and what's going on, what, what the PCP is, what the reasonable adjustment is, um, you know, uh, or, or if an amendment would obviously be allowed, it can be very, very useful just to, Say, look, this is this is the case that we think it is, and we, we accept that, and we accept this is the PCP in the case. Um, it's just so helpful to be able to say to a judge and have a, a neatly packaged claim and say, right, we've conceded this, we've conceded that, PCP is this, this is that. You know, there's there's six things that a judge can say, great, that's all knocked off the table. These are the issues, these are the issues that are left. And it just makes you look as a respondent, like a, a you know, realistic, sensible, if you can look realistic and sensible as an employer, and that's always a very, very good start. Now, when I say a polky chagger and contributory conduct for your friends, um, again, I know time, there's a great deal of time pressure, and there's often, it's very, very difficult, and you know, it, it's right, we're gonna stick polky and we'll stick chagger, we'll stick contributory conduct, boilerplate clauses, they have to consider it anyway, um, that said, it is worth putting some thought in as to what actually is your case. Well, the case is, even if you're not, you know, even if you're not with us on the reasonableness of the sanction, at the very least, this is going to be a final written warning. And given the history of this claimant, that on a final written warning, that they would have been dismissed within three months, or whatever it is. Um, and, and while tribunals are generally charged with having to deal with these things in any event the problem can be is if you have something very specific to argue uh, on these points claim on my side right i didn't know they were gonna gonna run that specific point which requires specific witness evidence or specific documents and it can lead to problems delays potentially even postponements and costs so the earlier you think about these things um, the better um, and, and more importantly i, I suppose it, it, it highlight something early you know the, the judge reads the the grounds of resistance and sees from a very early stage that this is the argument you're going to be running and they're going to be thinking about that from early doors and going to be thinking about, uh, about it and it's something to highlight to them early it's also a good opportunity to think about things tactically and um, so uh, again that that point for example about well they would have been dismissed anyway but you might be thinking that's not the greatest point to run because if we're going to run the argument, you know, they would have been dismissed anyway. It might feed into a claimant's narrative um, saying, ah, you see, they wanted to get rid of me. They, they were going to get rid of me at all costs. But 
highlighting it early in the grant of resistance gets you thinking about those kind of things as early as possible. Um, quote from another case here, uh, general principles affect the, affecting the ordering of further effective particulars include that the parties should not be taken by surprise at the last minute, that particulars should only be ordered when necessary in order to do justice in the case or to prevent an adjournment, that the order should uh, not be oppressive, that particulars are for the purpose of identifying the issues, not for the production of evidence, uh, and that complicated pleading battles should not be encouraged. Um, Useful when pleading leaves uh, gaps, request for other information is useful when pleading leave gaps in understanding of the other side's case, can help uh, to flush out weaknesses. Take care, of course, not to give the other side an opportunity to strengthen their own case. Uh, and sometimes it's better to use the pH to deal with gaps rather than request for further information. Um, and you have a three way process judge, claimant, respondent, and careful management. Um, and I have to say, if it's a little bit in person, I'm sure many of you experience this. Further information is, is, is a dangerous game. And sometimes we're put in the position where we run out of time or you know, the, the judge just wants to deal with it in that way. But you, you know what can end up happening. You just get reams and reams of further information, which just leads to more requests. Um, and that can just really complicate matters. And I, it, it can be tempting just to have a short two-hour pH, keeps costs down, but sometimes it can be worth having a slightly longer pH, sometimes even a day. I, I did even have a two day hearing once to clarify the issues. And again, your clients are no doubt gonna balk at that, it's extra cost, they'll surely we can get it done. But a, a day at the beginning can save a lot of time and aggravation um, at the end. So if, it, if it's a day rather than two hours and further information, and then that further information means you have about, um, you know, 10 hours worth of email exchange, um, it can be very much worthwhile. Uh, I, I'm speaking to a judge recently. I mean, they 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 say uh, they are re it's really being pushed in the judiciary to avoid further information and um, wherever possible. I, I thought it's a mixed bag. You know, it just depends on the judge and their pressures and their personalities. Um, but uh, the idea is that further information is is not the ideal approach, from what I was told. So uh, maybe kicking out an open door there, and it's uh, say worth trying to push for that uh, in, in tribunal rather than waiting for further clarification later. Um, so to uh, the list of issues, uh, a list of issues is a useful case management tool developed by the tribunal to bring some semblance of order, structure and clarity to proceedings in which the requirements of formal pleadings are minimal. And then the famous Zippy case, uh, that list of issues uh, then constitutes the roadmap by which the judge is to navigate his or her way to a just determination uh, of the case. A uh, good list of issues provides a checklist. You can cover jurisdictional issues, time limits, employment status, continuous employment, the legal issues, dealing with all the tests. And, and sometimes and it can be forgotten because um, often you, 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 know, you just get a, a list of um, you know, you get the virtual test and an unfair dismissal claim. I judge say, yes, well, look, you know, the tribunals have been around since the 70s. We, we do know the law of unfair dismissal. What we're actually looking for is where, where the real focuses are. And I appreciate it depends on the complexity of the case. And you're not going to have a, a very, very detailed um, list of issues, especially as it's getting person. But if there are key factual issues or, or things you can pin down in a list of issues, and um, that can be very helpful. Um, but make sure you cover everything. Forgetting can be costly, uh, as we all know, two parties are legally represented and they agree a list of issues as a general rule, that is it. So get it right. Um, sit closely, of course, to the legal tests. Um, no relevant paragraph numbers to the pleadings. That can be helpful, though some judges don't like any references back to other documents. But nevertheless, if you've got paragraphs in the pleadings, at least that will um, be of assistance if the judge wants you to put the paragraph in the list of issues, they'll tell you. Uh, it's a good opportunity for respondents to force claimants to nail their colours to the mast. So to say, well, who are your comparators? You put it in a new list of issues, claimant TBC, who the comparators are, or claimant TBC, what the PCP is. And it's really good at, the, at this stage to get this pinned down. Um, and it is a neutral document, but you can um, highlight uh, a factual dispute. Perhaps there's a factual dispute where it looks prima facie 
very strong for your client, well, it'd be good to have that factual dispute highlighted, as I said, um, to the judge from a very early stage. So that looks a bit odd and it might, uh, might assist. Um, and it might be useful if a, if a PCP was, uh, was challenged, just to know why a PCP was challenged. It can be, it can be very helpful to, to highlight these issues early on. And you can put some pressure on the other side. They, they see the list of issues and it, they, they read it back. You might start thinking, no, oh, actually, yes, they've made a good point about the PCP, which we pleaded, and doesn't make any sense. Uh, maybe we need to settle this. So it sort of puts a little bit of pressure on them. Um, standard case management directions for trial, witness statements exchanged well before trial, and um, list of witnesses, uh, count the potential witnesses in, so yeah, more err on the side of caution, um, and listing uh, for trial err on the generous side to avoid the trial going part heard or inadequate trial timetable. And as I said at the beginning, slightly flippantly, but it, it is um, it is tempting to always you know reduce the case down. Um, in order to save costs, but it rarely helps in the long run. Um, if, it, if it's rushed, if you go part heard, that really will massively get increased costs. I, I have a general rule of thumb. I sort of have an instinct on a case. So, well, that's a four day, and then I would add, add a day um, because you have to build in time for tribunal thinking, writing, and delivering judgment. Um, so that that can be a useful rule of thumb. So if you say this is my instinct, I'm adding a day, and then as I said at the beginning, you go to the trial and say, look, this is what the, the reasoning we've come to. But but what do you think? And of course, judges have a view because they they have a slightly different perspective on it. And they've got to, uh, as I said, they have to take their own thinking time. They may have a very different view. So it may look very simple to the parties, but to a judge looking at it more neutrally, might actually say, well, this is um, this is a lot more complicated than you think. It's going to take three days to deliberate. Um, going back to the first one, um, witness statements, it's often a standard sort of put in, the, in an agenda that uh, you want to do witness statements four weeks before trial, six weeks before trial. And I suppose it does depend on the, the priority of the, the client. Um, there is a cost issue. I know witness statements are the most costly part of uh, working on these cases. And once you've kind of done witness statements, a lot of costs have incurred, perhaps settlement becomes more difficult. So I appreciate there'll always be a cost benefit analysis. Um, but in pure prep terms, very, very hard um, to really assess a case's merits until you've seen the witness statements and seen the other side's witness statements and, uh, as well. And that's how you kind of test the evidence into the contradictions and, and, and to see whether witnesses really understand their case. So the later you leave it, the more difficult it can be for case prep. So, as I say, early witness statements is useful for case preps. Um, if there is absolutely no chance of settlement or if the parties are pretty entrenched, that may be uh, uh, a time to do that. Um, the hearing bundle, and, and again, looking at the clip art, you don't want a judge looking at you angry, pointing their oversized hand at you. Um, if they brought a gavel in, that would be particularly concerning. So we have to do everything we can to ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, hopefully these tips will help. Start with a good descriptive index, clear, visible, correct, continuous page numbers. Ensure all pages are present and legible. Um, uh, agreed type, that yeah, agreed type versions of hard to read notes. That is absolutely, I, I, I probably should have put that in red and bold and 150 type font because it is so difficult um, in preparation. It's really quite concerning. Obviously, these, these meeting notes, it's often disciplinary meeting notes, appeal notes, grievance notes, they're absolutely crucial to be the difference between winning and losing. Um, and sometimes you have um, excellent um, HR people who've taken notes with wonderful big clear handwriting, but ultimately you have scrawls and it is it is make you know not only prep difficult, but it, you know, you might miss something. And then you sort of find out later, oh, yeah, by the way, it says not rather than, you know, and it can really, um, really, it's really a problem. So it depends on the notes and you may have to be selective. And I appreciate cost was an issue, but that's really, really important. Keep out irrelevant documents and avoid repetition. If possible, avoid uh, starting trouble arguing over bundles or with each party providing their own bundle. 
uh, and a list of acronyms can be uh, very useful if it's a uh, jargon heavy case. Um, looking at the index, how it can be helpful, just going back to the first thing, I had a recent trial where there were lots and lots um, of transcripts. And what the, the indices uh, showed is which transcripts were agreed and which transcripts weren't agreed. And it was really, really helpful um, because in a, in a trial, um, it, it saved a very long time, 20, 30 minutes. It was quite a, a, a difficult trial. Um, the judge was getting quite tetchy, but just, to, you know, just which ones of these are, you know, getting quite frustrated, said to the index, right, 43, that one is agreed. Great, we don't need to look at that. That's agreed, or we need to look at that across the demo. No, but that one isn't because. Um, so you can use it as a tool um, to, to speed things up and again, try and make you look professional and serious and sensible. Um, so you've got to look for a, a, a coherent order, start with ACAS certificates, pleadings, orders uh, and directions, main body of documents, um, additional uh, chronological sections for pay slips, medical records, comparators, policies, inter-party correspondence, and then mitigation separate. So in terms of witnesses, obviously um, these matters uh, always turn on the facts of the case. If you're the claimant, often you're only gonna call the claimant, you might um, call the, the claimant's partner or family, uh, disability, um, and they can give uh, evidence of contemporaneous accounts of disputed facts, sometimes seen you know, partners who were on a telephone call or, or they, they were, you know, uh, had it on speaker and they heard a telephone conversation. So it, it just can bolster and assist the a claimant's evidence. And of course, there's always a, a, a worth seeking uh, witness orders. We all know the risks of witness orders. It can all go horribly wrong at trial, but it can help settlement. If you've got a sort of killer witness who's refusing to come and get a witness order, that can, uh, that can help. Very long time ago when I worked at the Free representation unit or I was a volunteer there I've got a witness statement and they um, they just uh, they just crumbled so it, it can be can be very helpful but you, you know what it's like with that um, for the respondent if it's about an exercise of discretion sort of unpaid dismissal for example you call the decision maker um, and if it's just a case that really just depends on decision makers mindsets just think about really whether you need to call anybody else um, unfair dismissal is a good example. The investigating officer is, is rarely called, but it can be useful. If the dismissing officer is weak, it can, uh, it can perhaps bolster it slightly. I mean, it, it depends on the facts. Where there's a complex or a technical investigation, again, that can be useful um, to have someone who sort of understands it, even if the dismissing officer didn't. Having someone explain it very clearly can, can assist in that regard. Um, if there's any weakness uh, in the dismissal or appeal decisions, um, the investigating officer is often the best route to, to a polky reduction and the wrongful dismissal claim benefits from calling them. Always remember um, where there is a wrongful dismissal claim, like contributory conduct, the judge will actually have to make actual findings of fact as to what happened. So the investigating officer can help highlight things uh, in, in that regard. Um, in discrimination, call, call everyone impugned. It's really, really important. It can be so easy with you know twenty allegations, and you know the big ones, the dismissal, but there's other ones there. It, it can be really, really important not to miss out. You know, go through every allegation. Say, Who is the impugned person? So if you don't have them there, and you don't have their live evidence, you don't have an explanation from them. Reversal of the burden of proof, for example, and you're, and you're done. And if you lose on one discrimination claim, then there can be a bit of a domino effect. So just make sure each allegation do i have a, wit a live witness who can give evidence as to actually what happened the key is what motivated individuals as to why they did things um yeah you never quite know who's who's going to be the better witness don't don't make any assumptions in that regard um and calling a witness who only speaks to one or two issues actually it's, it's, it can be really helpful firstly in cross-examination it's very easy to undermine but there's also this sort of instinct well so four paragraph statements and maybe everyone skirts over you've got the you know, the, the, the 20 paragraph statement of the decision maker and everyone's really close to that and you slip in a, a witness with three or four paragraphs getting two key factual findings and great, that can make a massive, massive difference. Um, but 
but only you only need you know it's not a numbers game just choose who you need Um, so the witness statement, um, take a step back, why are you calling a witness and what do they need to cover? Checklist can help. So that's what I said at the very beginning about what's your narrative. Always taking a step back, obviously you need to highlight the right facts so you can prove the legal tests. Um, but what is this witness trying to achieve? What is the story they are telling? Is this witness going to portray the claimant as, you know, an unfortunate person who we really liked, just was really unfortunate or a, a pain or whatever it is? What's this witness trying to tell? Remember the tribunal's lack of pre-existing knowledge. Really, really avoid jargon. In a witness statement, start from the principle that, you know, I mean, the, the judge will know nothing about, about that business. They don't. And I often find in conference, um, you know, there's a problem in a witness statement. If you're having to ask a lot of questions, trying to just clarify what, what basic things mean, you take a step back and, you know, can this be explained um, to, you know, to a to, to, always a good test is, you know, can I, have I distilled this in my own mind that I can explain it to a six or a seven year old, that it's that simple, I get it. But the more jargon and the more technical knowledge you're using, the further away you're going to be. And you just don't want the judge to have to spend too long on these things, focusing on your, your arguments. Um, minutes of meetings, the tribunal, um, you know, you put the page numbers in, they should read it. I will be able to highlight key paragraphs if there's anything cross-examination. Really best, instead of just copying the whole meeting and where you know the judge's eyes glaze over or they just like all right fine well, i'll come back to that if you, if you want to pull out five or six key things they're much more likely to remember it um, a clear narrative sets the unconscious bias in your favor and I, I cannot emphasize how important this is um there, there's a there was a psychological experiment where there was a speaker came to the front of the room the left side of the room had a very negative biography about him and the right side of the room had a very positive biography about him. And by a massive margin, the left side of the room with a negative biography didn't really think a great deal about speech. The right side of the room that had a positive biography thought a lot more of speech. Extraordinary, same people, same group, all hearing the same speech. Witness statement is your chance to frame the case so that when the judge has read the statement, they may have a certain view of the claim or they may have a certain view of the dismissing officer. And if you can do that, every single thing that has been said might be seen through that lens. So it's really, really important, as I said, that you're thinking about what are you trying to achieve in this witness statement. Um, spacing, page references uh, make a judge happy and uh, where possible use a witness's own words uh, and avoid using words they don't know. Um, it was a, a bigger problem uh, in the good old days and showing my age just when their witness statements used to be read out. But I remember I had a, a client that says it had the word it, they used the phrase colloquially there was a it, it was a i can't remember the exact word but it was, it was colloquially known as and when the witnesses were reading the statement colloquially and it just it just creates such a bad impression because i mean judges know how these things are prepared but if the witness can't get can't actually understand their own statement it's terrible for credibility um, and it doesn't help. And I say that obviously no one's reading it anymore, but in cross-examination, um, these things can still um, come out. Um, check, check, check again, the actual the statement. Yeah, it's obvious, but it's worth checking. Uh, no unnecessary inconsistencies anywhere between witnesses, between that. Um, if there's an inconsistency, uh, explain it away. Uh, I suppose you can have a hopeful silence, no one will notice it, it depends on the facts, often just being upfront can make you look, you know, quite confident, but it depends on the facts. Um, ensure witnesses uh, internalise their statement of relevant documents, I tell them read it again and again and again and again, once you've read it again, read it three more times, I mean, I've patronised witnesses slightly I think, by saying that, but it's so important that they do that. Um, uh, and always ask for comments on the other side's statements. It really, really helps. Um, and it's really useful to have it before a conference. It can save so much time rather than having to say to every witness, and depending if it's a very long statement, did you say that? Did you say this? Did you say that? Did you say this? Because there's often a lot of new things in there, particularly where there's a little bit in person. So the, the brief. Um, you don't have to 
uh, out on the ET3 consumer will we'll read all the, uh, the key documents. I think it's much more useful to highlight the really big things. Um, and uh, I call it good gossip could be helpful, but yes, it's really useful to know internal politics, personality clashes, are there any motivations there? Um, yeah, it's very, very important, you know, if, this, if, 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 if a witness, for example, is very, very sensitive or they are, um, they, they've left the business and they, they're really reluctant to give evidence, you know, to treat them more with kid gloves, whereas someone else, you know, more robust might not be a problem. Pick up the phone if it's if it's something you really don't want to write down, if it's, you don't want anyone to see it, that's fine, you can pick up the phone. And very useful to know who's coming to the hearing, um, uh, where you, you know you've asked them to meet us, uh, how the bundle's going. There's just basic facts like that. Um, in terms of prospects, really important that you you let us know what you think. Um, if you have concerns or think of please say so. Of course, we will always, as barristers, give our own advice. If we think the case is better. Um, then, then you think it is, we'll say it. If you think it's worth, we'll say it. But obviously that has to be managed. Um, what your view of witnesses are, um, as what information you've passed on to the client. So if there's a, a document, a prospects document, that's really helpful to have in every uh, brief. Um, is there any sensitive information that shouldn't be shared? And as I say, if you have a prospects or a remedy document, um, so for example, if you've laid out what you think the case is worth and why, that can be really helpful as well. And it helps us. We, we have more arguments. I've said I have prospect documents where we think you're going to, these are your strengths, these are weaknesses. It just helps highlight some of the key facts and, uh, and beforehand. Um, and it is useful to, to have it beforehand. I, I, I certainly don't like talking about prospects or settlements in front of witnesses wherever possible. Maybe it uh, undermines their confidence or distracts them. Um, so it's always good to have a separate HR person um, who, who is independent of the case, ideally someone who's not giving evidence, just so you've got that point of call, who, you know, they can join you on the call, conference ends, witnesses go, then I'll have a chat with you and the, the HR person um, to separate the, these things out. Settlement, um, any offers? How's it going to be funded? Uh, you know, obviously, if there's an insurer or a union in the background, it's really, really important for us to know what are the client's motivations, helps us focus on outcomes. Um, but, you know, are there any other things, any other matters I need to know about? Um, is, there, is there a bigger picture here? Are they trying to deter union claims? Is it a precedent in the case which may encourage others to bring a claim? It's, it's always useful to know um, the bigger picture so that you know when we're advising we can uh, we can be sensitive to that um clients view on settlement you know if they're expecting as i've already said they're expecting oh yeah you're definitely going to win and i have to say no i think you're very likely to lose it's useful to know um and i need to know who who are the decision makers to make sure um firstly as i say to separate things out um but also so i can give give proper advice and particularly a tribunal so i know if i need to call someone urgently Um, I'm sort of getting to the end of my uh, poor estimate, so I won't spend too much longer, but you can see here in conference, um, sometimes pre-pleading, I know in reality that's not going to happen most of the time, I know most of the time, time limits just mean you plead yourself, but for these, you know, it's, you may need some assistance to the best points, or if it's complex, big case, all these things, um, sometimes if it's pre-witness statement, you may and want to involve us in larger cases. Um, if you need to sort of say, well, what, what do we need to put in statements? Um, really you ought to have the statements drafted before. So if I did have the statements drafted before, um, you in attendance is, is usually very helpful. Um, and then we may need another conference after the exchange. <clears throat> Post witness statement exchange is usually the time you have uh, the conference. Please do pick up the phone um, to see how long uh, the conference will probably last. I tend to find, and um, there's always an underestimate. So it's important, over the, you know, sometimes you have conferences where witnesses have been told it's an hour and we get to sort of an hour and a half and they've made other plans or they're saying, well, why is this going on so long? Or is all of this irrelevant? About a week or two before, because there's always documents, there's maybe time to negotiate. Perhaps if I've got a different view, 
uh, you've got a bit of time to deal with it before the trial. As I say, have comments on the outside statements. Um, and it's useful to know who the witnesses are. These, you know, veterans who have been to tribunal several times before, so I won't waste any time on outline procedure or if there's someone particularly nervous or I need to outline procedure. Um, that's the time to, to let me know. Last minute developments always happens. Um, there's always things that come out of statements, could be disclosure, supplemental statements, maybe even new witness. That's why it's useful to have conferences, as I say, a week or two in advance. Tribunals are relatively relaxed, but the reality is the earlier you do it, the better. You know, the last thing you want to be doing is scrambling around trying to take a witness from a a witness statement from a, a crucial witness that's been missed, you know, the day before tribunal, it just makes it a lot harder and the other side will be able to cry ambush. It just makes um, postponements much more likely and wasted costs. The other thing is consider how adding documents met that electronic bundle. Um, depends when you sent it. Obviously, we've, we've now got electronic bundles and I get to the point where I've got a thousand page bundle and it's all tabbed up and then obviously adding documents in the middle can always undermine that tabbing and I appreciate it sometimes happens particularly if I've got the bundle early and often the, the priority is well look we haven't sent it to the tribunal yet so we're just going to present the bundle as it should be to the tribunal you'll have to make do but if you are changing an electronic bundle please make sure um, to contact counsel and just say well look this is how I'm going to do it so I've got to do it and see how the barrister wants to do it I mean sometimes I, I like for example if, if there's um, uh, 50 extra pages, I, I often prefer to just have it in a separate PDF. And therefore, instead of kind of navigating to change my pagination, I just sort of keep with the original pagination. And then I go to the other documents where I can sort of dip in and out. It depends on the, on the case, but I think that's a, a useful thing to do. Um, I know often impossible, but come if you can, and um, bring post-it notes, don't be afraid to pass on messages. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind, and this is something I was trying to say to witnesses as well. I remember when I was uh, uh, very young, about the training, I went to a thing at Gray's Inn, and a high court judge um, made a really good point uh, about messages. So he, he was sort of sitting there, individuals giving evidence, they said something, judge didn't say anything, but just saw on one side a sea of lawyers just flying around and um, passing notes and passing notes to their counsel and the judge went, ah, okay, well, that was obviously important evidence, put a big circle around it in his notebook and later it became a crucial piece of evidence, which wasn't great for the, uh, the, 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 the case. So um, one way to do it, you know, sometimes it could be useful, perhaps to disconnect the, the, if there's a concerning piece of evidence, maybe wait a couple of minutes, just so it is, but, you know, calmly, just pass it up, no, no problem at all. Um, hearing notes are uh, useful. Um, cross examinations in particular, because it can be very hard to take a note while you're, you're cross examining, particularly if you sort of end up going off on a slight tangent because the evidence has taken you somewhere unexpected. Um, but yeah, cross examination is uh, important. Um, so, uh, yeah, very unreliable there, 45 minutes rather than 30 minutes, but hopefully that was useful. Um, does anyone have any questions? Okay, so how would you deal with a litigant in person who does not appear to have capacity? Um, that is an incredibly uh, good question, an incredibly difficult question. Um, uh, I, I know, because uh, my wife is a private client lawyer, I certainly know that questions of capacity are very, very complicated, even if you are a, um, even if you are, even if it's sort of your client, you know, they're drafting a will, for example, and it can be very, very complicated when your client, there's no, no questions like, like that. So you, you have to, there's a presumption of um, capacity, but um, if they don't have capacity, often you have to get a medical report. So it, it's incredibly difficult. Um, so I think that they're, they're, I think that what you'd have to do, I mean, if you're at, if you're at tribunal, um, you'd have to raise it. I suspect if someone is that, in that difficult uh, position, um, they don't have capacity. I suspect the judge would notice it themselves. Um, but while, while you're litigating, I, I, I don't really know, because they're not your clients, and I don't really know. I think you have to try and deal with them as best as possible. Um, and, and I suppose at some point, if it comes to a tribunal issue, um, 
a, a judge may have to have to assist. Um, but yeah, no, a, a difficult one. And I so have to say, I've, I've never encountered that in my practice. So uh, take my um, my answer cautiously. Um, if you are aware a claimant has brought previous unsuccessful claims, is there any way that can be used brought into proceedings? Yes, I I, I think so. Um, it's quite useful now. If you, there's obviously the database uh, that you've got, you've got a database where are their previous judgments. So if you have a um, a serial litigant, um, that can be used as a as a credibility point, and it, it just depends on the fact. You might be able to have the previous judgment brought into um, the bundle. Um, so yes, I, I think it can be credible if there have been a, if there has been a previous claim or something relevant. There may be estoppel issues, and there may be issues about you know previous findings of fact as well. And um, so that can be brought in. So yeah, absolutely, I think previous judgments can certainly be relevant. But it just does depend on the facts of the case. A reduplication of documents when an investigation report appears once in the chronology of events, then in the hearing pack, and then appeal pack. Would you put it in possibly three times? I feel the tribunal need to know what was before the panels, but it is repetition and can sometimes mean lots of extra pages. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I don't think you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, not having having a, rep, a duplication of documents can be very frustrating. It's a waste of pages, can be frustrating. I, I think as long as you had the investigation, uh, you have the document in the bundle, it's been mentioned, it's put into context, then another witness can just say, um, for the avoidance of doubt, um, that document was in front of me um, and, and, he, and he, you know, it might be, and here's the evidence, like here's the invite letter which shows it was there or in my rationale. So you can sort of say, I had it in front of me. Here's, here's proof I had it in front of me, um, but putting it in for a third, it doesn't add anything. I, I, unless there is some specific reason, I wouldn't add it uh, unless there is a, uh, unless there's a good reason. Is there anything that you find comes up most frequently when you review prep as an error of frustration for you that solicitors could remedy? Um, I, I, I think I highlighted a, a lot of them um, in the talk. There's no one thing, but little things add up. So, um, you know, it depends on the case, but particularly for conferences, it's usually practical things because ultimately, you know, claims are complicated. Sometimes the laws miss, sometimes the facts are missing. It just it, we, all, we all do it. You want to get to tribunal, you miss bits and pieces. It happens, but really practical things like um, not having long enough in conference. So if I, I think it's a three-hour case and then only having a witness for an hour could be very frustrating. You know, firstly, everyone has, you know, like you prepared a lot. And, and if you don't have a, the witness long enough, you know, you have to come back or you just don't have what you need, and that can be frustrating, or you know, it's the practical things, you know, maybe you've ended up saying something you shouldn't and upset a witness, or um, you've, you've, you've given, you know, you've, uh, um, you've, you've revealed something you shouldn't, you know, all those kind of little practical things that I've said, you know, that can just affect the smooth running of a case, um, bundles changing. I, I suppose, Preparing a case can be stressful enough, difficult enough. There's a lot of pressure, and you just want to make sure all those little quality of life issues are um, are dealt with to make sure that you can just focus on the facts, the law, uh, winning advice. What should and shouldn't be redacted in the hearing bundle? Um, it's interesting. I, I went to a talk. I went to a talk. Um, uh, on this, uh, given by uh, an individual in chambers, I think you might be re repeating it. I'm pretty sure there's, uh, we, we might be, I might have seen it, but um, and it might be something I'll speak to about. But the, in terms of redaction, it can be, um, I'd say it was, a, I went to a, a 30 minute um, sort of seminar on it. And there's all sorts of case law and, and there's different points. So I, I don't think I could answer that question in general. But it's an important topic, and, and as I said, I think we are dealing with it. And if we are not dealing with it, then uh, I will I will sort of mention it to the group and see if, if someone wanted to do a seminar on it because it is an important subject. It's quite quite useful. The one I went to. Okay, I think that is all the questions. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and as I say, if you've got any questions. Uh, Nick Singer, and said at the beginning on the first slide, um, 
please be in touch. And if you ever feel like you want to sort of run something past me, just to get a second to the second opinion, or feel please feel free to get in touch with me at, at Chambers. Um, but thank you very much. <laughs>